up everybody this is whiskey with the werewolf hunter and I am Brian Easton author of the autobiography of a werewolf hunter series tonight we are sampling uh, some high rye bourbon this came from Trader Joe's I get the feeling we may have done one of these before uh, it seems familiar but it might not have been this particular brand anyway uh, this like I said it came from Trader Joe's uh, which has a good reputation for some uh, producing some of their own quality items so we're going to give this a we're going to give this a shot tonight uh, yeah so the high the high rye just means that they use a higher percentage of rye grain in the mash um, as opposed to corn or, or, or wheat so to you yeah it's not bad um, like I said Trader Joe's has a good has a good reputation for uh, doing some of their own products, and that, that's not bad as a, as a high rye bourbon goes. I've had better, I've had worse. So I just wanted to share this with you. I've been thinking about it for the last couple of days, uh, reading through some of the things that people have written about the uh, the series, and one thing that kept coming, people keep coming back to, is the fact that Sylvester uh, Logan James or SLJ is not a nice guy. Uh, he's a he's not really a hero type at all. He does some pretty horrible things uh, through the course of his life and over the the, the trilogy, and uh, so I was thinking about that and how how though it was never really my intention to paint Sylvester as an anti-hero. It just he just kind of became that because of the evil that he is fighting. See, I framed the werewolf as like the most vicious. Um, terrifying creature, Hell's Apex Predator, I've said it before, uh, just, the, just the bastard of all bastards as, as monsters go. And so if you have a human being that's going to fight that kind of evil, you know, you dive right into the Nietzsche's abyss, which is the quote, of course, that leads off the series. But over the course of his life and over the course of my writing him, Sylvester went from becoming this well-meant werewolf hunter, in my mind, to becoming the kind of a vicious uh, anti-hero that he becomes in the series. And this is all due, of course, to the, the evil of his opponent. Uh, and in comparison to which, uh, Sylvester is very much the good guy uh, when you're comparing, uh, comparing it along those lines. So I just wanted to mention that uh, before we went any farther tonight, just to kind of get it off my mind. And I think we're going to have a good show for you tonight. Uh, I've noticed that the that these clips have becoming as have become uh, successively shorter uh, as the weeks have gone on and it's not necessarily that I'm running out of things to say or to talk about it's just that my time has become uh, more and more limited as we go along and part of that is due to the time of the time of year that we're entering into the autumn and uh, Halloween season but I've got some uh, I've got some things in the works and I'm going to announce uh, announce some of that later on but uh, until we get to that, enjoy what we got coming up. Okay, guys, so I told you about this, I believe, in one of the early episodes of Whiskey with the Werewolf Hunter. This is my monster hunter shrine behind me. You can see it is a coffin-shaped uh, box of shelves, and it is arrayed with all these different tokens, uh, objects, and symbols, of, uh, of famous monster hunters, not only from film, although that does make up a large majority of it, but also from popular fiction, uh, classic fiction, you know, what have you. Uh, so there's a number of things on there, as you can see. It's it's uh, I've been a few years collecting the different uh, items. So anyway, we'll start off with the obvious ones here. Uh, right up front, we have a uh, carpenter's mallet kind of old-timey carpenter's mallet here uh, and uh, the, the wooden stake behind it there uh, which is uh, for obvious obvious use uses um, I, I also have a large iron stake that doesn't really fit on this so I don't have it displayed um, let me see if we can get some of this get this hammer and and spike off of here so we can take a look at some of the stuff behind it. There we go. Uh, now at the very top here uh, is, uh, is an arrow. 
Uh, it was a Native American arrow uh, with uh, hand fletching on the on the back and uh, napped flint for the arrowhead there. This is representative of the Navajo uh, monster slayer. And while this arrow is more of the Plains Native American variety uh, and not Navajo, uh, that's what it symbolizes nonetheless in the Native American broader sense of culture. Uh, this is a copy, well this is uh, a book with uh, a cover that I designed for Tobin's Spirit Guide. So Ghostbusters are represented here. I also have a kind of a art deco type uh, shot glass here. Anybody know where that's from? This is from uh, the original Blade Runner movie. Uh, so as you can see, my, my definitions of monster hunting and monster hunters is a little broad up here. So cause I'm including Deckard uh, hunting for the replicants. This is a cigarette lighter with a, the logo for the, the Bureau of the... What is that? Bureau of Paranormal Investigations, I think, something like that from uh, from the Hellboy series. There's a bunch of monster hunters if there ever was one. Got a bottle of or a bottle labeled for Rotenone, which is the which is the stuff that they use to drug the Gill Man in the Creature from the Black Lagoon original movie. Again, the 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 label is a, one of my own designs. I have a pipe here. Now this pipe could be for any number of monster hunters, but this one specifically symbolizes Captain Ahab in his search for Moby Dick. This here is a, a mead horn, which I have to represent uh, Beowulf, who was one of the first monster hunters on record. Uh, on this side here, there is a kukri knife representing Jonathan Harker from the Dracula series or the Dracula novel. Here I have a, uh, I have a, a scapular of strung human ears. Uh, of course they're not real. These are they're, they're latex and painted but I I got them from a at, a at a horror con and decided to make the scapular out of them. Now this is actually not um, for Daryl Dixon from The Walking Dead, as some people some people think, uh, this is actually my tribute to um, Blood Meridian and the the character in uh, uh, Davy Brown, who collects ears and strings them on a scapular and wears them around his neck. Again, he's not really a monster hunter, uh, but he is a character from fiction that I. Uh, that left so an impression. This on. is what I was trying to show you. This is a Imperial Arms Bowie knife. This is for Quincy Morris, of course. Uh, this guy is uh, very large, as you can see. He's got the Star of Texas on there. This is called a Musso Bowie, or a Musso Musso. I believe it's Musso, uh, and is uh, considered to be uh, at least one of the incarnations of the Bowie knife. So I got the got the big boy up here because I figured Quincy Morris is going to have uh, a Bowie knife is going to be the big one. I have other things for Dracula too. Uh, I have this bottle of holy water, which I which represents uh, Abraham Van Helsing. Uh, somewhere at one time I had a an Edison cylinder in here for uh, Doctor Seward, but I don't. I don't see that at the moment. The two pistols here, which are uh, flintlock replicas, are, are for Solomon Kane, Robert E. Howard's uh, Puritan witch hunter, uh, monster hunter character. Uh, back here is a press pass for Carl Kolchak from the Night Stalker series. I also have um, the, sh the King County Sheriff's patch from The Walking Dead for Rick. Uh, over here behind the mead horn, 
are, are a couple of business cards for Dana Scully and Fox Mulder. And I can't really see that very well. I have to reassemble this whole thing by the time I'm done. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, the uh, replica of the Vampires Everywhere comic from The Lost Boys. So this is a tribute to the Frog Brothers from that movie. I've got a bottle of Hypnosil for the Dream Warriors pursuing Freddy Krueger. Right? Good old fashioned knitting needle. And that is uh, that's the original Halloween. Jamie Lee Curtis <laughs> right in the eyeball. And of course, I also have the old silver bullet for my favorite monster hunter of all, Sylvester. And that claw kind of goes along, goes along with it. On this side, we've got a crucifix. Now, this is more for the uh, Father Marin from The Exorcist. And I've got an amulet here with a pentagram for the Wolfman. Uh, I've got a pair of dog tags that say Herald Angel from Angel Heart. Uh, I've got an Egyptian amulet. I've got this pocket watch representing Sir Malcolm from the Penny Dreadful series. And it goes on. But uh, maybe we'll pick up on the rest of that stuff some other time. But I just wanted to, just wanted to give you a, a look at, the, at my monster hunting shrine. So it's time for another installment of Let's Talk Shop. Continuing with the code of the monster hunter. Now, there's a lot of rules or guidelines uh, in the in the code of the monster hunter, and I've gone through six or seven of them with you. There's more to come, but I picked that one especially out of the group that I wanted to, to share with you tonight because I think it's one of the most important aspects of of hunting monsters uh, from a p certain point of view. Uh, the 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 point is uh, for tonight is that. You will rarely be so effective as a hunter as when you assume the role of prey. Now we see this in the, in the Werewolf Hunter series. Sylvester Logan takes the role of prey a couple of times, uh, that at least that I remember off the top of my head. Uh, uh, he takes the role of, of prey in uh, the, the suburb of Louisville. Uh, when he faces the, the, uh, the Louisville wolf, he dresses himself up. You'll remember as the, the mother of uh, Kevin Monroe, boy who was murdered by the werewolf. He's got on cold cream, he's got a nightgown on, he's got perfume on, night, you know, this, all this stuff, all geared to throwing off uh, the wolf's sense of smell. So he, the wolf doesn't smell him through um, his, his visual disguise. And uh, if you don't know how that turns out, it's pretty exciting. Doesn't turn out well for the wolf. Um, but assuming the role of prey, and he's not the only one that that does this. You know, you can look to nature and find predators who are ambush predators uh, who will, you know, play the role uh, of the, of prey, such as uh, the anglerfish comes to mind, a uh, deep sea form that has that little um, kind of a I forget what it's called, but it's got looks like a little. Uh, bug or something on a on the end of a on the end of a, a fishing pole and it gives off a faint luminescence and the creatures that see it come and try to eat it they think it's prey well when they get there they find out who the predator really is uh, so there's lots of ways to there's lots of ways to hunt uh, and not just not just werewolves I'm talking about period uh, depending on what you're hunting there's a way to do it and there may be a couple of ways to do it if you like, if you're deer hunting, um, most of the guys that, that that I know who deer hunt, they they hunt from stands. They have tree stands out in the woods, and uh, you know they have them out there for a while to kind of season a little bit, and then the, they get up they get up there and wait wait for the deer to come along. They're not out there actively walking and stalking uh, like you, like you might do say if you're hunting rabbits or you're squirrel hunting. That's more of an active role. Uh, you won't be so successful as a monster hunter in the active role usually uh, that's because you're aside from your weapons you're not really the predator you are the prey you are trying to switch those roles around 
uh, and make the and and do that effectively. So, continuing to assume the role of prey, which the beast knows you are anyway, just kind of reinforces that in his mind, makes him all the more uh, comfortable, uh, unalarmed by your presence. So that when you raise that 10 gauge up from under the Afghan and blow double lot buckshot into his crotch, he's got, uh, he's got quite a bit of surprise in those eyes. So I mentioned earlier that we had some, uh, some things that we're working on here at the Werewolf Bar. And uh, what we're going to be doing here, I'm not going to say what kind of timeline I've got for this because I'm not really sure. Uh, like I said, my own time has become very constricted lately and it will become increasingly more so toward the end of the year. So I think we're probably, this is probably going to be the last regular weekly um, episode of Whiskey with the Werewolf Hunter. The ones that will be coming up I'll announce, or if you're, if you're subscribed to the channel, you won't have to worry about missing them, or when they're coming, you'll be notified. So I encourage you, if you haven't already, to hit that subscribe button down at the bottom corner of your screen so you won't miss an episode. Uh, I'll announce it on Facebook and stuff when the next ones will be. And just so you know, I've got some things in the works there. I'm going to plan on having some guests on the show. Uh, some, some select people that I have invited uh, for this first, uh, first go around anyway. We'll see how it goes. And uh, hopefully we'll be hearing from them on future episodes. And we're going to mix it up a little bit and have some fun with that. See, what, uh, see where other people are coming from when they're in their points of view when it comes to the book uh, and hunting of monsters and all kinds of mayhem. So until we start doing that, I want to say goodnight to you. Thanks for being with us. Happy hunting and mind the moon.